readers. What is all this uh, about? What is this book about? Well, uh, one of the things that as a, as a novelist I think is very hard to do and I try not to do is to tell you what a novel is about, you know, mm -hmm. because in a way a novel should be about everything, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So it is. It, but it, what it are is the major points that led to this uh, book hitting all the records? It won various awards and prizes. I don't think that anybody ever knows that, you know, like mm -hmm. what is it about a piece of music or what is it about a piece of literature that that touches somebody or that become successful it's not a formula you know so if it were people would just be selling it like you know mm -hmm. mosquito repellent so I, I really I don't have an answer to that question it's just it's just a way of looking at the world through of course your own experiences you know mm -hmm. it was something about your story uh, some of it yes some mm -hmm. of it yes but not all of it you know mm -hmm. all novels are in a way something that it's, it's a way of trying to understand the world or communicate the way you understand the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it, it is set in a little village in South India, which, you know, which is where I grew up. Do you have other novels? Are you working on something new? <sighs> yes, I am actually right mm -hmm. now, after mm -hmm. a long time. Why the god of small things got all this fame, though you had other writings? No, it was. I didn't have other writings when I wrote. It's the only novel I've written mm -hmm. so far. So but you have many other essays or something. That was much later. Yes. You know, and uh, I mean, it's hard for me to say actually now which are better known because uh, the God of Small Things obviously it's a novel and it has a different kind of appeal and readership mm -hmm. and so on. The political writing, in fact, in India, especially in the non-English speaking mm -hmm. populations of India, the political essays are much better known. Right. And also uh, in many places around the world, you know, because the essays, they don't just exist as books, you know, they are on the internet and mm -hmm. they, they are about things which I think uh, the world is very, very concerned about now. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's hard for me what to compare. What are the main issues that you try to tackle through, through <coughs> your essays? Well, initially, I mean, the first essay that I wrote, actually, um, it was when India did a series of nuclear tests in 1998. You were very critical of this issue. I was very, very critical. And it was just at the time when the rise of the Hindu right had begun, you know. Um, and by now here allow me please uh, yeah. I wish that you can explain mm. to the audience what do you mean by the Hindu right who are they affiliated <coughs> to what kind of politics do they uh, follow well uh, you know I mean when when India was partitioned after colonialism in 1947 Pakistan was formed out of what was considered mm. the original actually the British really marked the outlines of uh, India mm -hmm. and then India became India and Pakistan and then in 71 it became Pakistan was split into Pakistan and Bangladesh mm -hmm. so that was a uh, Pakistan was set up as an Islamic state and India was supposed to be a secular state but uh, right through from from the early 1920s there was this there was this movement uh, which began with a sort of um, what is called the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is really a fascist organization, a Hindu fascist organization, mm -hmm. who who actually are great uh, are great fans of Hitler and so on. And they said that the Muslims of India are like the Jews of Germany, and they wanted India to be a Hindu republic. Mm -hmm. Of course, forgetting about the fact that there are Sikhs and Christians and all kinds of other other, other denominations. denominations and sects and uh, but in um, in 1992 in fact now it's the 20th anniversary a very significant thing happened where this Hindu right uh, this kind of fascist tendency uh, 
they demolished what was known as the Babri Masjid, which is this mosque, this 14th, 15th century mosque mm -hmm. in a place called Ayodhya, which had been built by, by Babur, mm -hmm. Emperor Babur, who began the Mughal dynasty in India. Mm -hmm. you know? And they said that actually the mosque was built on the birthplace of this, mm -hmm. the Hindu god Ram. And after the demolition of, of that mosque, mosque. Uh, you, you, you saw this BJP, which is the Bharatiya Janata Party, sweeping into power by 1998. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they did when they came to power was the series of nuclear tests. And those tests and that period began to change the language, the political language in India. You know, it became very ugly, very nationalistic. Uh, it was, it was a, it was a very terrifying stage and then mm -hmm. soon after 9-11 happened in America and it just yes. and it just fitted in with the agenda of the Hindu right you know mm -hmm. so to kind of a corner ghetto wise attack mm -hmm. uh, Muslims here yeah you said that after 2001 uh, attacks on the Trade Center uh, things are not going to be the same again all over the globe you said this well, because, you know, uh, what happens is that for a whole series of reasons, this language of the war against terror, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how we'll translate into Arabic, mm -hmm. but how can you have a war against terror? They didn't call it a war against terrorism, for instance. They yes. called it a war against terror. And it gave governments all over the world, certainly in the United States, but also in countries like India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. It, it gave governments the right to go to war against sections of their own population. Mm -hmm. It gave them, it gave democratic governments like India the right to make uh, laws which, which are just completely undemocratic. Not to say that India, India is a country which from 1947, which is the time of independence, there has not been a single year when the Indian army has not been deployed against supposedly its own people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whether it is Kashmir or Nagaland or Mizoram. The Indian army has been at war with its own people. But this 9-11 uh, just gave it an international, um, you know... Uh, Mode. It, yeah, it, yeah, it allowed it to, to become something completely acceptable. Right, but they say also, according to observers, that uh, this Indian army is not responsible for, it, for what is taking place in Kashmir, and that it's only related to uh, the infighting of the parties and the maladministration of the local government there. No, 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 that's not true. I don't think anybody tries to say that. The Indian army is deployed in Kashmir. It's the most densely militarized zone in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, so it has something like uh, more than half a million soldiers deployed there. Mm -hmm. In the, you know, since the 90s, th there's, there's been about 70,000 deaths. Even now, you keep hearing about mass graves. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just been the most successfully kept uh, secret. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody knows, nobody knows much about it. Nobody talks much about it. Because um, India is a great favorite in let's say the United Nations as this great democracy, you know, one colony which mm -hmm. somehow managed to maintain uh, elections and democracy and so on. But underneath that, there is a, an incredible violence, mm -hmm. uh, not just physical violence against people, not just murdering as in Kashmir or in Manipur or in Nagaland, but also a violence which has allowed this country to become a country where there are more poor people than all of the poorest countries in Africa put together. Mm -hmm. You know, there is, a, there is a violence of deprivation, of displacement, of taking away from the poor and giving to the rich. And all of it is, is, is beautifully upholstered under the guise of democracy and elections and so on. It becomes very hard uh, to make a case for what is going on, you know, if, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for instance, in 2002, 
the Gujarat government oversaw the massacre, the rape and the burning and murder of something like 2,000 Muslims on the streets of Ahmedabad, which is a city like Delhi. But right. it was all right, you know. Mm -hmm. In 1984, the same thing was done by the Congress government, where 3,000 Sikhs were burnt and killed here in mm -hmm. Delhi. Nothing happens. You mm -hmm. commit mass murder, so nothing So you commit happens. all these crimes and there's always impunity. And if it had been, let's say, Saddam Hussein had done it in Iraq, you know, when they were preparing to attack, you can imagine what would have mm -hmm. happened. So inter the international media decides what crimes it should highlight and what crimes it should keep quiet about. Not that it kept the, the quiet about... The same thing that's happened uh, with certain media outlets yeah. when it comes to the issue of Bahrain, when it comes to the issue of Syria, when it comes yeah. to the issue of Egypt. But it's no surprise. I mean, you know, I'm not. Uh, I think it's time to, for us to understand this as a as a process. You know, one is not complaining or expecting that they are going to act fairly because everybody mm -hmm. has business interests. Everybody is playing a game, and this is all part of it. You know, so. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, just here, I would like to note that you are the spokesperson of the anti-globalization movement and you're also a vehement critic of the neo-imperialism and of the global policies of the US. These uh, three headlines are going to be the focus of our questions after the break. Okay. Right. The Insight will be back after the break. Stay tuned.